I'm going to talk about the global issue and a, a bit about some of the work that we did um, in 1972, believe it or not. <coughs> Andrew Sinclair and I discovered that the, um, thank you, that uh, the brain required docosahexanoic acid or DHA or omega-3 if you like. And um, as a consequence, one, it wasn't difficult to put together a simple scenario that if the food system didn't support the brain, the brain would go out of the window. So uh, we wrote a book called What We Eat Today, and in it we said that unless you took the brain into consideration in terms of public food policy, then you'd find brain disorders would start taking over. And the book was reviewed by Graham Rose in the Sunday Times in 1972, and uh, November, and he said, in his review, unless something is done to prioritize brain nutrition, um, then we will become a race of morons. That was Graham Rose, not me, but uh, he said it was me, but it was Graham Rose who said that. And the tragedy, of course, is, is that, um, in fact, this is what has happened, that now we have, and I will come to it, now we have brain disorders that have overtaken all other burdens of ill health. Now, looking at the, the perspective of DHA and what it is, we studied the, um, from the beginnings of the life on, animal life on the planet, dinoflagellates and things like that, who lived about 600 million years ago, and went through the, um, the cephalopods, the fish, the amphibia, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, and the DHA content of the photoreceptor was identical over that 600 million year period. It was also identical in terms when the brain formed in later time to the synapses and the neurons. And it's actually, you see through a, the pleasure of DHA in your photoreceptor, and you think, talk, walk, and do through action of the brain through a DHC of DHA in the synapses. And to me, this is the most compelling evidence, the 600 million year track record of DHA in building brains is the most compelling evidence um, for the absolute essentiality of DHA. And just to make the point, uh, you won't be chemists, but you can see that we have double bonds in the precursor, which is missing one double bond here, and there's another fatty acid missing a double bond there, so the problem is that these six double bonds is really critical, but the difference between those two fatty acids is only one double bond, only two hydrogens, and neither of them were ever used throughout 600 million years of evolution. This illustrates the absolute essentiality of that particular molecule. And we know about the difference in terms of these electric, electrical maps of it. This is the precursor which is so shallow and f ends up round about here where the double bond is missing, but it goes continuously throughout DHA, and I could give a cool, full lecture on that topic. Now, in a sense, the, we started knowing about DHA and the brain. We've started thinking, well, what's going to happen during pregnancy? And so the mother, we formed the Mother and Child Foundation in 1994, and it supported work on low birth weight and preterm delivery because these are the two cardinal risks for neurodevelopmental disorders of, of one form or another. And what we saw effectively, quite simply, after many years of work, it was distilled into the fact that poor maternal nutrition carries a risk for low birth weight independent of ethnicity, whatever race you were, Independent of your socioeconomic status, no matter how much money you had, if you ate a poor diet, that was the problem. And independent even on smoking. So nutrition of the mother during the pregnancy and even before pregnancy was independent of ethnicity, smoking, and socioeconomic status. We then carried out a randomized controlled trial um, in the east end of London, and this showed that it prevented uh, micronutrients d uh, provided during the pregnancy even prevented small for gestational age at birth by 2.3 fold. So we therefore had the, 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 the test of nutritional status and the evaluation in terms of a trial that proved the point. However, there's more to it than just micronutrients because in fact DHA, maternal nutrition, 
and health prior to conception, which is what we now find, is the primary determinant of the outcome of pregnancy. Um, now, we, we, in fact, this is, I, I can show you lots of data about what happens during DHA deficiency, but this is a, a, a rat mother being given a deficient diet and this is a rat mother being given a diet with DHA. And you can see how the brain cells of, of the fetus are forming to for, moving to form the cortex, whereas in the deficient animal, there's very little of that kind of activity. And this has shown up in many experimental animals and, and even clinical trials. But that illustrates very vividly the impact of DHA deficiency during pregnancy on fetal brain, brain growth. And we've done, a, a, as Rachel said, a recently just finished a trial of 300 pregnancies. And in effect, we found that the um, receiver-operated characteristics for a fatty acid, which is uh, a measure of the status of these fatty acids that are used for the brain, that it predicted preterm delivery very early in pregnancies, the earliest we could get them. It predicted preterm delivery with a better than 90% confidence level. Now that is pretty good for biology. And um, what it effectively means, because we use the red cell membrane for this study, and the red cell membrane has a half-life of 120 days, what it means is that the condition of the mother and her health and nutrition in the months prior to conception is what matters rather than anything that happens during the pregnancy. Um, whether the mother had diabetes, hypertension, or preterm delivery, was determined by her condition when she entered pregnancy. It's a very simple and obvious fact that the mother, that nature prepares in advance, doesn't leave things to the last minute. And reproduction is one of the most important things that happens in nature. And it's clear from this evidence that it is the condition of the mother in the months prior to conception that really matters to completing the pregnancy outcome. And we looked at the magnetic resonance imaging of the baby's uh, born to our study, and what we found was quite interesting that, don't forget that our interventions were not preconception, they were after they came to see us, which would be about 12 to 14 weeks after conception. But despite that, we're still able to see connectivity differences in the cortex of the brains, uh, in the corpus callosum, the whole brain, and we saw these through magnetic resonance imaging in the boys but not the girls. It's interesting there was a, a, a severe sex discrimination on the ability of the nutrient during pregnancy to, to make a difference. If we started before, we might have made a difference in the girls. Now, boys are born with bigger brains than the girls. And in fact, they need it because they, they have a bigger surface area. They're bigger. And the surface, every single square millimeter of your skin is connected to the brain so that you know where you are, what you're doing. And because boys are bigger, they therefore need bigger brains. It doesn't mean they're more intelligent, but they need bigger brains. And in fact, boys are much more susceptible to essential fatty acid deficiency. We've known this for centuries, well, not for centuries, but actually almost nearly a century, uh, that the male sex is extremely sensitive to a central fatty acid deficiency. And so seeing it in the boys but not the girls is telling us again that these essential fatty acids are critical to brain development before birth. And brain development before birth is cardinal because once the brain is formed, it's difficult to do anything to change any kind of disorder that has happened during the prenatal period. And just to show you some things which we are seeing unexpectedly in the study. We are seeing white, altered white matter intensity, punctate lesions and, and cysts. But the altered white matter, and these are in babies which would have seemed to be normal. They're perfectly normal babies. But we're seeing these sort of st strange uh, changes at, at birth, things that are happening prenatally because you don't see inside the brain unless you, unless you use magnetic resonance imaging to, to get at it. And, for example, a child could be born perfectly, apparently perfectly healthy. And by 18 months, suddenly, the mother wakes up to the fact that the poor fellow doesn't walk properly. Then the pediatrician says we need a neurologist. The neurologist says we need an MRI. And then the definition of the, the outcome is that we, here we have a child who's going to require 24-hour nursing every day of his life. 
with cerebral palsy. So there's a lot of work that we've got to do to sort this out. And in terms of cerebral palsy, um, at our hospital at Chelsea in Westminster, Martin Bax conducted a, a, a European study and he showed that the lesions for cerebral palsy was always prenatal. Therefore, it was not, therefore it was not due to obstetric mishap. That means cerebral palsy is preventable like neural tube defects. Nobody's thinking about that at the moment, preventable. Um, and the trouble with, with cerebral palsy, of course, is it's the tip of an iceberg. With allied disorders like epilepsy, autism, ADHD, learning difficulties, visual and auditory disabilities. And so we are now planning a study of 1,000 pregnancies to target the specific deficiencies such as, specific, sorry, disorders such as auditory disabilities, autism and the rest. And then we want to go on to a 25,000 study of pregnancies to stop cerebral palsy. We think we can get the, we've already got the evidence, but we have to do the, the big study that's going to, and we can do this at Imperial, because Imperial has five teaching hospitals, each one with 5,000 pregnancies. So we can easily make 25,000 pregnancies in one year. So that's what we're uh, 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 doing. Our goal is to make these disorders past history with better therapies and to stop preterm delivery and stop the rise in mental ill health. Now this is a graph that was published in 1954 by people who were concerned about the increase in population. In 1804, there was one billion people on the planet and it took 127 years to add another billion. In 2000, it had reached 6 billion. In 2011, it had reached 7 billion. And we're knocking on the door of 8 billion at the moment. And <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it is not sustainable. The logarithmic rise in population has led the Foresight Think Tank to claim that there is not enough arable land to feed this 8 billion people. Um, the world capture of fisheries had reached a limit in 2000. Now we now have the brain evolved in the sea. There's been extreme investment in intensive land-based agriculture to the cost of our heritage in fisheries and seafood. And now what's happening is we predicted in 1972 a rise in brain disorders. The European audit in 2004 put brain disorders at 386 billion, um, and that was top of the list. They said, oh, that's all due to new diagnostics, so they did it again. In 2010, it was 789 billion. The UK, we got the government to do the assessment, the Department of Health, and in 2007, it was 77 billion for the UK for brain disorders. Uh, and this was a greater cost than heart disease and cancer combined. Um, in 2010, it was 105 billion. 2013, 113 billion. If this keeps on going, you can wash out Homo sapiens. It's no longer sustainable. And Stephen Hawking is actually agreed with that. So we've now got to farm the seas. And people are doing this in the Far East, but we're doing not, not doing anything about it here. Fishing is hunting and gathering. Neanderthal, 10,000 years ago, they said, well, you know, the land-based foods are limited. We've got to develop agriculture, and they did it. We've got to do the same in the seas, and it's the only solution to this crisis of mental ill health and the global overpopulation. So the last century, uh, our, my final conclusion is you need to look at the data. The average height increased, showing the impact of nutrition on moving the body, increased by 0.4 of an inch every year, every 10 years, uh, at the beginning of last century. Um, then you had an increase in mortality from cardiovascular disease and various cancers, which were really rarities before that. This was the epigenetic impact of the change in diet that we're talking about. The options for this century are basically an increase in neurological disorders, a decline in intelligence, and an increase in antisocial behavior. Because that's what's going to happen if brain, mental ill health keeps on rising. Or we could do the opposite and get an increase of intelligence uh, for our children. Ladies and gentlemen, it's this future of, those, of our children and their children that's at stake.
Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>